Welcome to Eden Prairie United Methodist Church. We are a vibrant and transformative faith community rooted in the love, grace, and radical inclusivity of Jesus Christ. I'm Becky Jo Messebrink, the pastor at this church, and on behalf of this wonderful community of faith, I welcome you to our time of worship today. We, are, we value uh, partnering with parents in nurturing their children and youth in a progressive and inclusive faith that guides them to become faithful followers of Jesus Christ in the, in the Wesleyan or Methodist way. Today marks an opportunity to celebrate the culmination of some of that work as we celebrate two of our high school graduates later in worship today. I want to remind you, too, that we value getting to know people we worship with. So whether you've been here a long time or this is your first time worshiping with us in person or online, we welcome you to fill out the Connect card. In worship, there's a, bu- there's a Connect card on the bulletin and also a QR code to follow if you'd prefer that. If you're worshiping with us online, you can follow the link to the Connect card online and let us know who you are and that you're worshiping with us so we can start to build that relationship with you. We also value praying in this community and we value the belief that our prayers make a difference in the lives of God's people. And so we'd love to pray with you. If you have prayer requests, you can share those either on the yellow cards that are in the pews in front of you here in the sanctuary. The ushers will collect those in a little while. Or if you're worshiping with us online, you can drop your prayers in the comment section and those will get to us to share later in worship as well. If you're worshiping with us at a time other than Sunday morning and you want to share your prayer request, we want to receive them and so you can do that um, on our website at prairiechurch.org and look for the prayer tab that's also where you'll find a myriad of ways to give to God through the ministries of this church um, on the give tab on our website and if you're here in the sanctuary there's a green card in the pew in front of you and that tells you all the ways to give while you're here in the building including offering plates as you leave worship today We've been in a series about what makes a Methodist, and this is the the culmination of that series as well today. And um, as we talk today about what it means to love others as a Methodist, I'd invite you to be a part of making our art collage for this. So if you get a moment during the opening song, you can go back to the art station that looks kind of like that. It's right back there on the outside the sanctuary, and you can grab a puzzle piece and some... um, some art supplies and you can during our time of worship create a piece of art on that puzzle piece that reflects what it means to love others as a Methodist. So also in worship today, um, we've got uh, our Kentucky mission team sharing some stories about how they loved others doing con- tornado recovery work. And so it's just a full service of, of good, uh, good ways about what it means to love God by loving others. So let's worship together. God has called us to be the people of love. God didn't mean the syrupy stuff of movies and novels. Truly loving can sometimes be difficult, yet we are called to reach beyond the difficulty with compassion. Loving others takes more than sentiments. We want to love as Jesus calls us to love. Let us worship God learning how to love others. I invite you to stand in body or spirit and join me in singing our opening song, When the Poor Ones.
You may be seated. Hello, I'm Connie Halsworth. For those of you that don't know me, but we're going to talk about our mission trip to Kentucky. And this is Deborah Lynn. She's uh, helping me out here. <laughs> nice. During the late evening of Friday, December 10th, 2021, a violent long track EF4 tornado moved across western Kentucky, producing severe to catastrophic damage in Dawson Springs and surrounding towns with winds up to 190 miles an hour with a path length of 166 miles. Families in Dawson Springs area, two and a half years later, are still trying to recover from the damage done by this tornado. This is the second year our church, along with the First Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian church of Wilmer, have joined forces to assist the Fuller Center Disaster Rebuilders Organization, as our shirts say. Their staff has been at work in this area from day one after the tornado. They were working on 14 homes while we were in Kentucky, as I said, two and a half years later, and re have requested a grant to continue their work in future years on seven more homes. We were lodged in Madisonville, Kentucky at the First Christian Church, which specifically did an addition to their church for use by aid workers with lodging, bathroom, kitchen, and meeting room facilities. Pretty nice lodging for homemade bunks with Tempur-Pedic mattresses. <laughs> our daily schedule started with breakfast at seven along with packing our own lunches for that day, followed by devotions and morning announcements. Then we headed to their work sites which were about 30, 30 minutes away. The first house that we worked on, the Eden Prairie Group worked on, was siding the back of this house and repairing the front entrance and porch, as you can see in the pictures. Me meanwhile, the Wilmer Group, some of which are with us, was hard at work at this house installing flooring and cabinets, framing windows and painting. At the end of our workday, it was back to Madisonville for showers and dinner. Fuller served us a couple meals and we had some fabulous cooks along on the trip for other meals. Then it was time for more socializing, games and reading the notes from the Eden Prairie United Methodist kids. These were great. We really had some fun with them. One of them said, why didn't the chicken cross the road? Because KFC was on the other side. <laughs> they also wanted us to find out the recipe for the leaven, herbs and spices. Unfortunately, we never saw a KFC. <laughs> the next house we worked on was for the homeowner that you see in the middle of the photo. This family had completely lost their home in the tornado and they were working on building a brand new house with Fuller, um, which is a company that we were working with. We hauled in flooring, framed windows, and did lots of priming and painting. We actually needed a checklist to keep track, which you'll probably see on the next screen in the top center. They had no power at this house. So you can flip the screen if you'd like. We had no power, so we had a generator for some electricity. Oh, I guess we missed one. Um, we had a generator for electricity but it wasn't that much electricity, so we had some battery-powered lighting. But it was pretty challenging to be painting and priming on cloudy days without any power. Also, there was no water, so we had difficulty cleaning up uh, our paint equipment afterwards, so we had to take it back to where we were staying. On Wednesday night was church night. We were asked to vacate the facility where we were staying for church activities that evening. All 13 of us dressed in our red fuller shirts and headed to a local restaurant. We had a wonderful meal and a few drinks when the waitress announced, just to let you know, your bill has been paid. But if you want anything else after this, you were on your own. <laughs> she later told us that one of the local Madisonville bank presidents had, paid, had seen us and paid our bill. That was really quite a surprise and very pleasant. So we were proud to leave blankets and prayer shawls from both of our churches with the homeowners, in which we did meet all the homeowners that, whose homes we worked on, and we left them with the staff of the Fuller Center. We want to thank you for your support. Will all the folks who participated on this trip please stand? I think they're kind of obvious of the red shirts. <laughs> but if you also have ever participated in a, on a mission trip, could you please raise your hand? 
Mission trips are a great opportunity to share the gifts we have been given through serving others. Please consider joining a mission trip in the future. It is fun, rewarding, and you build great relationships with those you're working with. There's always something you can do to help. And if you're a rookie like us, you get to speak. <laughs> I invite you to join me in singing, We Are All One in Mission. following Jesus as a Methodist matter if we do not in some way share the love of God with others. All of our efforts and desire to grow closer to Jesus are not just for our own benefit, but also to bless those around us. Listen to how both of these texts remind us that loving others is the fruit of a life faithfully lived. God is love. When we make up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God, and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at house and mature in us, so that we're free of worry on Judgment Day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. We, though, are going to love. Love and be loved. First we were loved, and now we love. He loved us first. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. When the Pharisees heard how he had bested the Sadducees, they gathered their forces for an assault. One of their religion scholars spoke to, for them, posing a question they had hoped would show him up. Teacher, which command in God's law is the most important? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your passion, and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there's a second to set along the side of. Love others as well as you love yourself. These two commands are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hangs from them. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God, amen.
So, do you remember the old Frank Sinatra song, I'm not going to sing it, but you will be singing it in your head. Love and marriage, love and marriage, they go together like a horse and carriage. This, I tell you, brother, that's right, you can't have one without the other. Today we're going to talk, we're not going to talk about love and marriage, but we are going to talk about love. The two aspects of love taught by Jesus and reported by the gospel according to John. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. In other words, you can't have one without the other, right? Today we conclude our series on what makes a Methodist. We talked about the character of a Methodist follower of Jesus and the other four habits or disciplines that make a Methodist. Loving others rounds out what makes a Methodist. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives us the greatest commandment, the cornerstone of our faith, something that we teach our children, our youth, and our adults. We are called to love God with all that we have and all that we are, and to love others, our neighbors, as we love ourselves. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, a wise and savvy and yet practical pastor and theologian, he knew just how hard this commandment can be for us. So much so that in his writing on the character of a Methodist, he spent most of his time elaborating on this one, a Methodist loves others. All the habits or disciplines of a Methodist are an attempt to faithfully respond to the foundational belief that God is love and to know that this love is real and available for every one of us always. The disciplines and habits that make a Methodist we have already talked about, each of these focus on our inner experience of God's abundant love. And they focus on how a Methodist responds to that love by loving God, by rejoicing in God, by giving thanks, by praying constantly, and now by loving others. Each of these acts is a faithful response to God. And each time we act in these ways, the actions fill us up more and more, enabling us to know more of God's love in our life and being, be able to respond again and again to that love. The first four habits of a Methodist put the emphasis on us as individuals, our personal relationship with God. They are practices that fill up our spiritual tank, so to speak. They fill us with life and happiness and gratitude and the capacity for love. And yet, left on our own, we might get stuck in the rut of spiritual narcissism or spiritual consumerism. We might become inwardly stuck. We might be tempted to create the false notion that God is somehow here, God is someone who is here just to fill us up, to meet our needs. Jesus knew this human tendency well. Perhaps that's why Jesus gave us the greatest of all the commandments. 
Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and love others as well as you love yourself. Jesus gives it to us as a whole package. These two commandments are intricately tied to one another, so you truly can't have one without the other. In fact, if you listen closely to the story this morning, Jesus was asked by a religious lawyer, what is the greatest commandment, the one? What's the one teaching we should be following no matter what? Jesus' answer gives us, two commandments. He commands us to live by two guiding principles which shape our life and our lives together. Love God and love others. All the habits that make a Methodist work together in the life of one who practices them. They help us grow in our love for God and our love for others. As Steve Harper puts it in his book, The Five Marks of a Methodist, the marks, or what I've been calling the habits, are intended to nourish us in order to help us to love others in Jesus' name. These spiritual practices fill us up so that we can be poured out in love for others. And in order to live into this commandment, to make it a part of our life, we desperately need God's grace. We need God's unconditional love to seep into our lives. Because I don't know about you, But left to my own will and my own ego, love has a tendency to become far too conditional. If it's not rooted in God's unconditional grace and overflowing love, love can be fickle and inconsistent and scarce. Love can be reserved only for those in my life who I think have earned it or deserved it. Just ask me, about my experience leaving the concert last Saturday night. Now, we were in this simple state of needing to take turns, and we're all adults, because we're all driving cars, right? So we're all adults trying to take turns to leave the same massive parking lot, I feel obligated to mention, in Ames, Iowa. You're welcome. (laughs) And, uh, And there were two trucks in, in the, we were trying to get in the line, and there were these two trucks who like just kept moving without any space in between them. And I was a little angry and a little unloving. And my ego started to take over, as I'm sure theirs did as well, right? My attitude toward them was, well, love was scarce, let's just say. <laughs> my daughter was a little embarrassed. <laughs> Apart from God's grace, It is too easy to let ourselves get in the way of this commandment to love others. The way that uh, our lives can become more and more about our limited love and less and less about God's limitless love for the world because God's radical love is lavished on all of us unconditionally before we ask for it or recognize that we even need it. God's love is indiscriminate and it's excessive. God's love, God loves us with reckless abandon. And all of this is made real and made human in the person of Jesus Christ, who shows us the way of life-giving love for others. So how are we to go about this life of following in the way of Jesus? How do we practice loving in this manner? Perhaps the first question we ask ourselves is, who is the other I am called to love? Well, take a look around you. Here in the sanctuary or if you're worshiping at home or somewhere else, wherever you are today, look to your left. This is interactive. Look to your left. Now look to your right. Now look behind you. And now look in front of you. Take note of who you are seeing. These are the ones you are called to love. But also, when you go out from here, out into the world, you should be doing the same thing. Look around you and notice the people. Especially be aware of the people you don't usually notice, right? Because everyone you see is the other Jesus calls you to love. 
Jesus calls us to love all of the others, no matter their mental health challenge, no matter their immigration status, no matter their sexual orientation, no matter their economic status, no matter their gender identity, no matter their differing abilities, no matter their religion, no matter their race, love your neighbor, Jesus said, no exceptions. Jesus calls us to love our neighbors, our immigrant neighbors, our black neighbors, our atheist neighbors, our Muslim neighbors, our depressed neighbors, our conservative neighbors and our liberal neighbors, our queer neighbor, our differently abled neighbor, our incarcerated neighbors, our addicted neighbor, our homeless neighbor, our veteran neighbor, our you fill in the blank, every neighbor. Do you get what Jesus is telling us? Do you hear how the Gospel of John reminds us that loving God includes loving people? You can't have one without the other. You cannot love God without loving every other. So here's your self-assessment for this week. Just one simple question to know if you are on track or not. To whom are you showing love? Is it the people who look like you and think like you and love like you and speak like you and pray like you and vote like you? Or are you showing love to those who are others to you, who may not share your values or your life experience, but who are nonetheless beloved children of God, who are meant to be the recipients of God's love pouring out of your life into theirs. A Methodist loves God, rejoices in God, gives thanks, prays constantly, and loves others. This is the fruit of what makes a Methodist. May your practice, practice of the Methodist way of following Jesus be oh so fruitful. Amen? Amen. I invite the graduates to come forward and join Hannah up front while we sing They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. We've been blessed to journey with these graduates these past few years. We celebrate the way their faith has grown. At the same time, their minds have expanded through their education, and we pray this will continue in the future. Let's celebrate these amazing graduates. Now I invite you to raise your hands as a blessing over these graduates as we pray over them together. We thank you, God, for this day of achievement and celebration as we honor the hard work and dedication of our graduates. We ask for powerful presence and love 
to be with them in this grand milestone. Guide them with your wisdom and grace as they embark on their next journey. May they carry into the future the lessons they have learned, the friendships they have formed, and the dreams they cherish. Bless their lives from this day on with goodness and success. Enable them to stay true to themselves while growing, to use their gifts wisely, and to walk into the future with faith, hope, and great love. We pray. Amen. Let's bless these graduates with the song, Pass It On. Today, as we come to a time of sharing our prayers together, we pray for Kyle and Noah on their journey into adulting. I love that word because it's progressive. There's time, I promise. So we pray for Kyle and Noah on their journey of what is next. Lord, in your love. We pray with Deb Lind for an end to the senseless killing of police officers and public servants. We pray that they could go home safe and sound at the end of each of their shifts. Lord, in your love. We um, pray in celebration with Gail Chalby, who took note that Becky Coleman, our, uh, the, uh, our administrator who retired a few months ago, was elected the new secretary of the North Central Jurisdiction of the United Women in Faith, which is really great. Lord, in your love. We pray with Connie for all those impacted by tornadoes. There have been over 80 tornadoes in Iowa so far this year, along with many other states, and so we pray for their recovery. Lord, in your love. And we pray with Michael Bukema for healing and recovery for his mother, Josephine, who fell on Sunday, last Sunday, May 26, and fractured both of her hips. Her reconstructive surgery, though, was successful, and she is beginning rehabilitation. So we pray for that journey for Josephine. Lord, in your love. Let us pray. Let us pray. <laughs> in the midst of frightening times, when words of war soar to the heavens and anger seems to be the way to treat others and to respond to difficulty, be with us, merciful God. We do not want to live in unloving ways. We seek your peace and healing love. Our hearts are filled with concern for our families and friends, as well as those in far off lands who face great difficulties, illness and mourning. And still, in the midst of darkness, your light of love abounds within us. Your love pours us into the world, if we will allow it. Lord of love and peace, we have brought before you the names of dear ones in our hearts. Some of the names have been uttered out loud in the congregation, others are whispered in our hearts. 
Be with all of us, O Lord. Hear our, heal our wounds. Help us find ways to love our neighbor as well as ourselves, perhaps especially our neighbors, with whom we seem to have little in common. For it is this life of love that can change the world. We pray, O God, for a world changed by love, in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So there's some exciting things coming up in the life of the church that we want to invite all of you to participate in. This Wednesday evening is our um, connections event for June. We're going to be, um, we're going to have a, a potluck, right? A summer potluck. Okay, I had to remember this. And, um, and then we'll have yard games, weather permitting. If there, we can't have yard games, we'll be inside for yard games. You just watch. We'll make it happen. So um, dinner's at 5.30. Come and bring a, something to share at 5.30, and we'll have games afterwards and um, conclude by 6.30. But also I, I read that if you want, you can help Kristen and company weed the garden. It needs it. So that's also at 5.30. Okay. Um, next weekend, we have a pop-up choir. Um, so you can come at, I'm going to say 9 a.m. Is that right? Okay. 9 a.m. and meet up here in the choir loft. Megan will hand you a piece of music. You'll learn it. You'll sing it during worship. It's fabulous. So come and be a part of that next Sunday. Today, our fellowship time is in honor of our graduates. We have a cake for them, and so, um, which means we have a cake for you. Isn't that lovely? I love how that works. So that's part of today. I have two other things uh, unscripted. Sorry about that, and then I'll get to the blessing, but that's fine. Um, you all should have gotten a letter in your email inbox this week about um, a transition in staff happening, although we're going to slow roll this transition, which is fabulous. Um, Hannah, our uh, director, our youth ministries coordinator, I think I got the title right now, um, is uh, wanting to step out of that position, and she's given us a, a, a wide time to find somebody to fill that position. It will also help us transition. If you have questions about that, you can talk to Hannah. If there are questions for Hannah, you can talk to me if you have uh, questions that you would like to direct to me. Also, I want to let you know that next Sunday I will not be in worship with you. Paul Baldwin will be preaching. Um, some of you will remember him as the one who brought that fantastic um, uh, oh, um, Wiseman sermon. Wow, what's the Sunday? Epiphany Sunday sermon. Um, and so he's going to come and talk about Pentecost and its roots in, in the Jewish faith and what that means to us as Christians. So uh, that will be wonderful. The reason I'm not going to be with you next Sunday is, and you may all not know this, but my husband, Chad Gilbertson, is being reappointed this year as well. He's going to be appointed to the, the well in Rosemont. And so next Sunday is his last Sunday. And so I'm going to go share worship uh, and goodbyes with him and his community. And the following Sunday, he'll be here to share with us as well. So thank you for the grace to be able to do that. Let's stand as we are able for the blessing. God frees us and inspires us to love all persons. God helps us to love ourselves. Go and love like Jesus loved. I invite you to join me in singing our closing song, hymn 2184, sent out in Jesus' name. Sent out in Jesus' name, our hands are Justin. 